Let's talk about what SpaceX has been up to over in Florida, because there is a lot of really interesting stuff going on there, and there has been for a while now, but it almost always gets overshadowed by the main storyline unfolding at Starbase Texas. Florida is a bit of a side quest for SpaceX at the moment, but that doesn't mean it's not important. Actually, Florida is shaping up to be the new heart of the Starship program once it gets past the experimental stage and the new super heavy rocket begins regular service from NASA's Kennedy Space Center Pad 39A. And not only is the future of Starship in Florida, there is also a heavy connection to the rocket's past there as well. That is a lesser known chapter in the evolution of Elon Musk's Mars rocket. From what we can tell, this unsuspecting plot of flat land on the Florida coast is prime real estate for SpaceX to build their fleet of shining silver starships that will ferry humanity from Earth to Mars. The starship will launch and land from the space coast, though the details of how that will work are still up in the air, and that is something else we need to get into. So, here is a story about why Florida has been more important to the SpaceX Starship journey than you might think. This is the Space Race. Let's start with the made in Florida Starship that never was. The failed first attempt at building the Starship next door to NASA's Space Center. Most people know that Elon Musk bought up a huge amount of land in Boca Chica, Texas to use for experimental new SpaceX activities. But what fewer people might know is that he also purchased a plot of land in Cocoa, Florida, which is a small community on the mainland near Cape Canaveral, the heart of the American space program. Beginning in 2019, these two sites began simultaneous development on prototypes for what would become the Starship Upper Stage, a 9 meter diameter stainless steel rocket that was capable of landing vertically under rocket power, like a really thick Falcon 9, but with a much greater purpose down the road. The Florida Starship site was a lot more limited in scale than the Boca Chica installation, being that Coco was a population center filled with homes and businesses, while Boca Chica was a desolate wasteland populated by about 50 people living in a single block of ranch houses that had been frozen in time since the late 1960s. Though they both managed to churn out Starship prototypes, apparently SpaceX only ever intended to pursue long-term activity at one production site. They just wanted options. They wanted to see which team could build a better spaceship independently from each other. I shouldn't need to tell you who won that design competition. And in addition to the Boca Chica rocket being a superior product, we can also see the clear advantage that they gain by also building their own launch pad, which is just a short trip down the highway from their manufacturing bay. Even though Coco is the closest mainland community to Cape Canaveral, the journey for a Starship rocket, which must be kept vertical at all times to maintain structural integrity, would have it traveling down a public highway, then across a bridge to an island where it could be loaded into a barge, floated down the canal that splits Merritt Island, and then finally north through the sea and the narrow waterways to be loaded back onto a vehicle for the last leg to SpaceX Launch Complex 39A, where SpaceX would then have to test their experimental rocket in full view of the entire aerospace industry. So it's not shocking to learn that they never went through with this plan for a starship in Florida. It's preposterously complicated in comparison to the short trip down an empty highway. Apparently, there were also some issues with the steel production at Coco as well. The Boca Chica team just happened to have an advantage in both design and logistics. But eventually, Starship would return to the Sunshine State in a very big way. Elon Musk has said time and time again that for this whole Mars colony idea to work out the way he's intending, there is going to need to be a massive fleet of starships manufactured by SpaceX, up to 1,000 individual ships. So, to accomplish that, SpaceX is going to need their own version of a Tesla Gigafactory, a highly optimized and automated production plant that can output massive quantities of product as quickly and cheaply as possible. 
and they've been hard at work building version 1 of that Starship factory on Cape Canaveral. Like we said, this new base of operations is prime real estate, especially compared to the old Coco site, which does still get used, but it's been relegated to a bakery for Starship heat shield tiles. The new SpaceX operations area at the Cape is on Roberts Road, up in the north end of the Space Coast. It's in the same neighborhood as the Kennedy Space Center. This is just down the Kennedy Parkway from where all of the major action happens. NASA's Vehicle Assembly Building and the old Space Shuttle Landing Strip are on the same road, and just around the corner are the two most important launch pads on the Cape. 39B, where the SLS and the Artemis program will lift off, and 39A, where SpaceX operate the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy. Launch Complex 39A is going to be a future home for Starship launches as well. So, it's not all that different from the setup that they have now in Boca Chica, a production facility and a launch pad just down the road from each other. The only component that the company will still need to ship in is the Raptor engine that is manufactured in McGregor, Texas. But those can fairly easily be moved through the port of Houston, across the Gulf of Mexico, and into Florida. No big deal. It's a much more simplified process than what NASA has cobbled together for the SLS, where the entire booster core has to be shipped whole from New Orleans and floated into the Cape on a giant barge. Phase 1 of the Star Factory on Roberts Road is already well underway. It's being constructed right next to an existing SpaceX facility that is dedicated to refurbishing Falcon 9 boosters in between flights. And the area cleared for Starship is about three times the size of the Falcon 9 operation. So far, the Star Factory site has been used only to build segments for the Starship Stage 0 at 39A. That's the massive steel tower with robot arms and quick disconnect fueling system, along with the orbital launch mount and its own connection system for fueling and spin starting the Raptor engines. But we can see from the foundations that have been laid that the new Star Factory will have the same infrastructure that is currently in use at Starbase Texas, just on a smaller scale in a much more compact footprint a low and wide building to manufacture the stainless steel ring segments and engine thrust pucks and plumbing. And then, a series of vertical assembly buildings where the ring segments are stacked into super heavy boosters and starships. This construction is happening now, at a much faster rate than it did initially at Boca Chica, and while the initial ring manufacturing and component production in Texas has always been done in tent-like sprung structures, the facility at Florida is a permanent, solid factory, and this is only the beginning for Starbase Florida. New proposals from SpaceX suggest that up to 100 acres of additional land to the north of the existing site could be developed in the near future. The expansion would triple the footprint of the Starship manufacturing facility and give Starbase Florida a similar area to Starbase Texas. SpaceX says the land would be used for a combination of office space and facilities for fabrication, payload processing, storage, manufacturing, shipping, and receiving. SpaceX would also pave the dirt road that leads north from their facility up to Schwartz Road, which would give them a better avenue for transporting rockets to the launch complex. Being on site at the Kennedy Space Center also presents a whole new variety of launch and landing options for Starship that would not really be available at Starbase Texas. So for one, they have access to Launch Complex 39A, a historic launch pad that was ground zero for the Apollo program and the Space Shuttle. This is currently the only crew rated launch site in the USA. It's a pretty large area where SpaceX has already begun construction of one Starship tower in addition to their Falcon launch tower, with probably enough room for one more Starship tower after that. Another piece of infrastructure that SpaceX has on the Cape is their landing pad. Obviously, they are the only rocket company that has use for such a thing, and that brings us to even more future potential for Starship. So, if we look at the components that have been manufactured for the 39A Starship launch tower, we can see that the robotic chopstick arms have already been fabricated and are waiting to be installed. But it's been noticed that there is a bit of a difference in these Florida chopstick arms versus the Boca Chica tower arms. 
the Florida arms are much shorter and stumpier than the Boca Chica versions, and that's got observers thinking that the 39A launch tower will not perform the catch maneuver on the booster and starship. The way that Elon Musk envisioned his robotic starship tower, which he nicknames Mechazilla, was as a single machine that would support both the launch and landing of the starship and Super Heavy. The arms would serve as a mechanism to stack the rocket on top of the launch mount, and then they would also perform a catch maneuver as the rocket stages slowly descended under the engine's power. The booster would slow to a hover directly besides the tower, and the arms would clamp together like chopsticks to catch and cradle the rocket as the engines cut off. But the stumpy new arms for Pad 39A seem counterintuitive to the landing procedure. The shorter the arms, the smaller the margin of error for the booster landing approach. It just doesn't make sense. At the same time, observers around the Cape have spotted components being laid out for a second Starship Tower. Initially, we had just expected that would mean two launch slash landing towers at 39A, but maybe what they are really building is one launch tower and one landing tower. This is what SpaceX already does with the Falcon booster. In the rare circumstance where the booster returns for landing on solid ground, like with a Falcon Heavy launch, the booster landing does not happen in the same place as the launch. SpaceX have their landing zones much further down south on the Cape. It's a pretty desolate area off the coastline that is only surrounded by retired launch sites that have been abandoned for years and are actively being reclaimed by nature. And the reason that they do this is because landing a rocket is a much more unpredictable operation than launching one. If we go back to 39A, the Starship Tower is only a couple hundred meters or so away from the Falcon launch tower, which again is the only crew-rated launch pad in the United States. We've seen what happens when a Starship crash lands. It happened several times at Boca Chica during the testing phase in 2021. Those explosions threw chunks of debris that landed miles away from the launch pad. The potential for the Falcon launch tower to be damaged by a similar explosion at 39A would be very high, and NASA needs that Falcon 9 launch facility to get people to the ISS. So, it's very unlikely that SpaceX will be allowed to launch and land the Super Heavy booster and Starship from the same tower in Florida. They will likely do it from Starbase in Texas because there is nothing else around to get trashed, and maybe they can pull off enough successful catch maneuvers from there that things can change one day at Cape Canaveral. But in the meantime, we are expecting that the next SpaceX construction project will be a specialized Starship landing zone with a specific catch tower, somewhere far away from anything that doesn't want to be blasted with flaming shrapnel. And that's the story up until now. But the cool thing about SpaceX is that it is always moving forward at an incredible speed. So the chapters are constantly being written, and we know that the best is still to come. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.